Uh, my name is William Wong. Uh, I am asked to be the moderator. And uh, we have uh, quite a full program, I hope. Uh, I am going to allow one hour for the speakers. I would ask that each speaker uh, on the introduction to give a speech. And then after one hour, I hope that we, that will give us sufficient time uh, to have discussions. Um, can I just first start by saying a little bit about uh, how we come to this? Uh, I am part of the Archives Action Group AG. This was founded some years ago uh, as uh, a group of friends. We got together and found out that we do not, to our um, shock, have any archive legislation or laws governing our archives. Uh, so we got together and started discussing, finding out what are the archive situation in all over the world. Uh, and then we decided that it requires archives law. Uh, we then began to draft the archive uh, public records bill, uh, which you can pick up at the content outside. Uh, we presented to the government, that was about 18 months ago. Uh, thereafter, there was uh, a dialogue with the media to, uh, to invite the media uh, to give public exposure to this uh, problem. And uh, we had about three or four rounds of media uh, uh, briefing. Uh, then it led recently to let's go. Uh, a motion debate uh, by Margaret uh, uh, And today we have exciting further news of the publication of the Civic Exchange Report. Uh, but all that is going to come up. Uh, so uh, without further ado, because I want to be enough time for discussion, because I believe <coughs> that discussion will be the key. And what I will be proposing to do with the discussion is to take each subject area of what the, arch what the archives lack or inadequacy. So that throw open for discussion. I hope everyone uh, would be encouraged uh, to raise topic, uh, to give a comment, uh, to encourage debate, uh, and then hopefully by the end of this discussion, we will know uh, what are the pros and cons uh, of the system and where do we go from there. Because ultimately, uh, the question is, where do we go from there? Uh, so I will start by uh, inviting uh, Margaret Ng. But before I do that, uh, Margaret, of course, is well known to everyone. She is both a writer, poet, a lawyer, uh, a uh, everything, um, and legislator. And uh, she has been serving the Hong Kong uh, community for so many years. Courageous, moderate, uh, wholly bicultural, wholly bicultural. And uh, she is uh, here uh, to speak to us about public records and good governance. Uh, she's also part of the AG group. <laughs> Thank you very much for those kind but totally untrue words. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you realize that this is a very special occasion and you are at the birth of a very important movement. What is the most important thing is not what goes on in this room today, but what follows from it, because there is a lot of work be done. Now, as William introduced, he said in his, in his introduction, it so happens that last Wednesday I moved a motion debate in LegCo to urge the government to introduce archive law as soon as possible. And I shan't go into it because if you have received the civic exchange report, you will see already in Annex 2 Christine had put in the motion, as well as the amendments, some of them may be quite astonishing, especially Paul Chair's amendment. And you can see how people vote, and you can see
see that my motion was defeated by 24 in support, 1 in opposition, and 17 abstain. And you will be able to see from Annex 2 who were the people whose abstention caused the motion to be defeated. And this in itself will tell you a little bit about why such an important improvement, which is waiting for the Hong Kong community to, to uh, 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 bring about, is defeated uh, in LegCo. So uh, I'm not uh, uh, preaching universal suffrage and uh, abolition of functional constituency, but I don't have to do that. So, but now the concern for archive law is very long-standing. Uh, but this is the first time that we had a fully fledged uh, debate in LegCo. And what the motion debate means is this is, we speak, LegCo speaks through its motions and its resolutions. So this is the first time LegCo speaks as a corporation on uh, what it thinks about archive law. It doesn't matter that we're defeating, defeating the first time. Uh, it is important that we go on, that we don't go away. Uh, the immediate trigger of this uh, debate uh, was that there was interest in, uh, uh, um, uh, the interest was brought about by another legislator, um, Emily Lau, who is also very familiar to all of you. She asked a question about the destruction of public records in the move, the government's administration offices moving to Tema. And she wanted to know how many records were destroyed and what were they. And the answer is, I, I hope we have a picture of that, the amount of documents destroyed was three times the height of IFC 2. So it is 1,181 something uh, linear meter. So uh, this at once captured the, the uh, media's attention. Ming Bao carried a very large story on it. Uh, and uh, it so happens that on the day of my debate, the audit uh, um, office, uh, the director of audit came out with an audit report number 57. Uh, and chapter 10 is on the public record service, which exposed the shambles, the total shambles of public record keeping, preservation, management, and creation in the government. Uh, in my debate, the, the way we did it was that we, I had an opening, and then after the people wanted to make amendments and make their little speeches, then the government official, in this case the chief executive, the chief secretary, will make an initial opening. And in his opening, he just repeated the present system without batting an eyelid and said, this is going well, it's very well established, and uh, uh, it's effective, and legislation is not the only way of managing archives. Flying in the face of evidence. So that was because of the, the audit report. The audit is, uh, the report of the audit, director of audit, is an internal government checking. So, you know, with Margaret, you can say she's always against the government, you know, she opposes for opposes' sake. But not the director of audit. So all these, with all this evidence, yet government turned a blind eye to it. And of course, the, the media was interested. There's a lot of, of interest, a lot of, of drama in it, uh, a lot of very interesting facts and figures, really food for, for media reports, for very exciting reports. But the media attention is not yet focused. So what we have to do is to focus media on law, on the harm of not having uh, uh, archive law, legal rights and legal obligations. Essentially what the law does, that a policy cannot do, is that a law is coercive. You tell a director of uh, uh, public records to, uh, what well, he's not called directly, Anyway, the public, yes, the, the, the director of government, uh, the record office. You tell him to tell other government bureaus what to do. They will say, well, thank you very much, but I have better things to do. But if there is a legal duty, that's different. You don't need anybody to tell you. You only have to be reminded. So this is what we must focus on, but the public must at the same time know two things. One is, why do we need these uh, public records? 
how does it help uh, Hong Kong? Why should they be uh, preserved? And then secondly, why do we need a law to do this? Now, my part of this uh, evening's discussion is of good governance. And I am concentrating my talk on how a good governance, I have 10 more minutes, is that right? Yeah. Uh, how go good governance, what is the relationship? How does uh, the preservation of public records have anything to do with good governance? Um, and what are my observations as a legislator? Uh, I have been a legislative member for over 15 years. And this, to me, is a very personal kind of experience. Now, as to the value, I think the best statement is to be taken from the report of the Director of Audit, Chapter 10. If you turn to paragraph 1.2, you will find it described like this, and I quote, Records are valuable resources of the government to support evidence-based decision-making, meet operational and re regulatory requirements, and provide accountability. Good records management enhances operational efficiency and effectiveness, minimizes cost, provides proper documentation of government policies, decisions, and transactions, and ensures proper identification, protection, and preservation of records valuable to the government and the community. So this is the official statement of why public records, the value of preserving and managing public records. Now, I would like to go to these different aspects uh, point by point. First of all, evidence-based decision-making. Now, decision must be rational and not whimsical and arbitrary. You would agree that this is the, the basic tenet of good governance, especially when you look at the kind of decision government has to make about money, about resources, about our future, our well-being, about town planning, what Hong Kong is going to look like, and all that. And the Hong Kong government has lost a good deal of the confidence of the public because the public cannot understand how government decisions are made. They feel very, very much that it is arbitrary, it is whimsical, it responds to pressure and not respond, not based on evidence and not founded on good principle and reason. I'll name some examples. The appointment of political assistants, you remember, the public says you're paying these people a great deal of money. What is your objective criteria for employing these people? How did you select them? Show me how you did it. The government was unable to do it. Now, second example, the cash handout of $6,000. Why sudden the U-turn? Sudden $6,000 is quite a lot of money when you multiply it by uh, all the, 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 the adult uh, permanent residents in Hong Kong. How was it done? Was it under the pressure of these people who abstained from supporting Margaret Moon's motion? Housing policy, you remember C.H. Jones said 85,000 units per year. How did that come about? What happened to it? Does the, the one of the uh, CE uh, about to be candidates have anything to do with it? And if so, what? Uh, another example, the, the Visit of Hong Kong Yu, of the Vice Premier, why the security uh, um, uh, arrangement, who made the decision, how did it come about, was there any pressure, no answer. West Kowloon Cultural Complex, if you look at how it came to be decided, if you look at high speed rail, who was consulted, what figures did they look into, what decided the cost effectiveness, all this, did you have to justify it. The opening of the Chelakok uh, airport is another one. So this shows evidence-based decision-making. If you are unable to show evidence-based decision-making, people will lose confidence in the government. The second point, operational and regulatory requirements. I need not belabor this point because uh, they are, uh, for example, the Securities and Futures uh, 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 Commission the compliance of the law depends on disclosure. Uh, awards of numerous tenders and contracts of the government is a lot of procedure, and you have to be able to prove that you've gone through the procedure. The recent scandal of IPRO-A, you remember that? 
Internet Learning Support Program being awarded to IPROA, was that uh, 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 an impartial and objective process? Now, the next point, provide accountability. I know that very personally because uh, we have the experience in LegCo of holding the government to account in select committees. For example, in 1999, we have an inquiry on the fiasco of the opening of Chetlam Park uh, Airport when things were in a shambles. One of the questions we asked was who made the decision for Chetlam Park Airport to commission on that day? Was it political? Who was? Did they go through the right procedure? Did they consider the consequences and so on? And we call a lot of records, meetings, uh, in which uh, uh, very senior government officials join in to make the decision. Another example, the short piles, that was an inquiry in 2001, and then more, more recently, CM Ler, why was he allowed to work for New World uh, uh, Corporation, the New World Group of Companies? We call for the documents in which his uh, application was approved. We saw the handwriting on the margin, I approve. Right? Whose handwriting was this? On what date did he write, I approve? So we have first-hand experience how public records uh, 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 play a role in uh, accountability. Fourth point, proper documentation of government policies and so on, and that goes hand in hand with accountability. But more than that, um, I think what is not what missed out in the, in the audit reports, uh, paragraph 1.2, was that in the, the decision-making process of the government, in the course of decision-making, good civil servants put forward their independent views. I'm sure uh, quite a few of, these, of, of you who have left the government will remember the days when your independent views, no matter how unsavory, uh, were what make you a good civil servant. Not that you are able to say yes, but that you are, going, you are able to put forward reasons for no. And of course you may be voted down, you, your views may not be uh, accepted, but they will be fairly recorded. And in good time, people will see whether or not your advice was right. And the fact that this uh, 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 your views are preserved in this way for posterity to look at. And maybe some years down the road, people, when the policy fails or some adjustment needs to be made, people would look back to the records to see what was anticipated at that time. Now, you also remember that because you, your posting changes all the time, when a file arrives on your desk, you do not make a decision de novo, you do not guess out of the blue, but you look at the minutes which have gone before you so that you know what the rationale, what the principles were. So all these things encourage civil servants, pub people in public office to speak truth to power because that is more than the immediate present which determines how good a public officer you are. Now, finally, I want to add this point. It's not just within the government, but very, very important is the availability of all these records for public inspection. I can't tell you how important this is that you know one day someone else will be able to see this record. Now, this is a very, very good discipline. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, that sometimes even when things are not immediately publicly available, you know, when the meeting is not open to the public, it nevertheless acts as a powerful discipline for uh, 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 processes which are in confidence. I had the experience of sitting on the operational committee of the ICAC for about six years, which is the maximum number of years that we are allowed. And this, uh, the, what the operation committee does is that it examines files of the operation branch of the ICAC, which they say we cannot follow. So, because you know that you have a right to report the, uh, our matters to the, they complaints to the ICAC, and they always they have an obligation to follow. And when before they drop it, they will present these cases to the operational committee and explain why they cannot be followed. 
Now these meetings are closed, the, the records are not, uh, uh, are not open to the public, but the fact that they have to put it down in a record and make themselves accountable to someone who is outside the corporation is a powerful tool for them to be responsible. <coughs> now, however, you have to look at paragraph 2.10b of the audit report, and I thank Sid for drawing my attention to it. The ICAC's answer to the director of audit about their rules of preserving and destroying records is that they, being an independent organization, will follow their own rules, which are not open for inspection in destroying records, so they can destroy what they like. Now, so I have just touched a few points. I have also mentioned the very disappointing response of the Chief Secretary to the uh, speeches made by members. To me, I think that the fact that my motion and the way the motion was defeated shows you that you can no longer leave things only to LegCo or the government to carry on. To me, the most important thing is the matter has to go to the community. We have to have a community movement about archive law, and there is no time to lose. So I call upon you to take this upon yourself as your personal responsibility, and do not drop the ball. Carry it now until we reach a goal. Thank you very much. Uh, just a word on in our draft public record bill, we include all public funded bodies, including ICAC, within the scope of our council, including university, hospital, everything. Uh, Christine Lowe. Christine Lowe has been a unique person in Hong Kong. Unique, not because merely because of her elegance, but because of her devotion to Hong Kong public courses. She has been not only a Hong Kong legislator, uh, she has been a founder of the Citizen Party, Hong Kong Human Rights Monitor, but she is the head of the Civic Tech, which partly has been doing the most valuable work as a think tank. They produce reports, in-depth reports, scholar reports, independent and fair reports, as the example of today's release of the second edition of the report on Hong Kong archives. I commend you to read it. I read it last night, and I take my hand off to Christine. She has been working wonderful work for archives and she has been now working closely with us. So we are now joining forces, and she is a valuable uh, member of our cultural community. Thank you, Christine. Um, well, thank you very much for including me, and um, thank you for introducing and describing me as unique, and I'm now going to tell you about a truly unique problem in Hong Kong. Uh, I've been looking into archives since 2007, when I was alerted to the problem in Hong Kong by professional archivists. And since then, Civic Exchange has produced a, a first report, really laying out the problem. Now, we decided to do a second report because um, a lot has happened. Many more people have become interested in the issue. But for the purposes of the day, um, I'm not going to repeat what Margaret has said. And I'm anticipating uh, other panelists would bring up other points. So I just want to make a few concluding points as to why I think uh, this is very important. Now, you know how Hong Kong government always says that whenever they want to review a policy, they want to draft a new law, the first thing they do is they go for an international troll of best practices. Now, in the archives case, they are unique in not adopting this path. It's hard to understand why, and since 2007, having done the first report, having interacted with government, and many more people now have interacted with government, including the motion debate, including formal replies over the years in writing to medical questions and media questions and 
And now from our Chief uh, Secretary Stephen Lamb on official reply uh, on the motion, I still can't figure out why. Now, media friends always ask me to speculate. Why didn't they do it before 97? They said they were going to do something in the 70s and the 80s. So what happened? OK, I guess uh, uh, a very kind response might be, well, they were very busy. Right? Before 97, they were very busy. They were otherwise occupied. Um, after 97, uh, there was clearly no decision to take this matter up seriously. And in fact, I think in more recent years, we see a definite uh, uh, shield being pulled over the whole issue. Now, uh, in terms of international best practices, we've looked at the law of Singapore, Australia, Philippines, USA, mainland China, Macau, and in fact, in our first 2007 report, we have an appendix of many, many countries where we've looked at how they dealt with records and archives. So again, Hong Kong is truly unique in not embarking on that path. Now, these are some of the problems. But I'm, I'm just going to go forward first and show you this. This is not coming out very well, because I was just told that incompatibility of, of uh, computers. But what we tried to do here is just show all the regular problems. Because last time, in 2007, we didn't have nearly so many examples. <laughs> but since 2007, I think the problem has gotten worse. If we need one piece of evidence, is that picture about how many hundreds and thousands of files they've destroyed before they moved to Tamar. I mean, that is an example of how, on an en masse basis, they took an administrative decision not to follow their own practices. So um, if you look at, if you take a copy of our report, we do have a timeline where we show all the cases that we could track from uh, 34, where we track all the cases that we could find reported publicly. Um, you don't know how many there are in fact, but these are the ones that I think no one would dispute. Now, if you go back to this, this is essentially what we find. We lose records, records were not transferred, Records were borrowed from the archives and not returned. And there are years of backlog. Um, there's also been destruction of records, as we could see now with, uh, uh, with the Tamar case. And electronic mail, well, they haven't really dealt with it properly. So we could say, in fact, that Hong Kong is way behind other places in working out and investing in how to deal with electronic records. Uh, public bodies, as we've heard from the market, they've been, they've, been, uh, um, uh, they've been excluded. And this has been the case even before 97. And uh, even, even after 97, there's no interest in including, uh, even on an administrative basis, to encourage public bodies to keep archives. And we see the, a deprofessionalization of uh, people uh, within the unit. In fact, I'll just say that we see this in actually other departments as well. Uh, so there could be a trend in government of the professionalization of many, many units where they really should have the right people <coughs> there. But this is very clear in this particular case. Also, there's some confusion over the personal data privacy ordinance uh, and how archives works. And you know, I'm sure uh, those of you can perhaps give some examples later on. So this is really the point that I want to make. We are going backwards, it seems like. And if we can imagine, it's like a Hong Kong's records. If we can imagine this is like a, it should be a steady stream of water going into a reservoir. And the reservoir is ours. It's the collective memory of Hong Kong. And it has many functions, as uh, Margaret has explained to us. And over the years, this stream, this steady stream of water has become a trickle. And the, water, uh, the reservoir is in fact being depleted through record losses and improper destruction. 
Now, I would say this is a very serious situation, but as I said, it's a unique problem. I don't understand why we have to stand here and talk about it. Now, sometimes media friends say to me, they say, well, there's no public pressure. The public can't get excited about files, old files. And when the media reports on, on some of these cases that we've listed out here, they don't talk about it in terms of governance and records. They'll just talk about it as an issue. So they will report, for example, even when government wanted to claim money back from developer in Discovery Bay and couldn't find their own files. <laughs> reports are just that, well, that there was a ledge code discussion, they couldn't find their own files. Well, that's the end of the matter. Too bad for the government. But if you think about it, then you will see that these are, this is a very bad example of uh, administ poor administrative practices. If they could have found the file, if there was a justified case for claiming back money that belonged to the public purse, then that would have been good for Hong Kong. Again, we have cases where we get to the courts where the government department didn't keep the file. And this was one particular case with the immigration department where the judge was quite upset and where the immigration department acknowledged that they didn't keep the files. And these were fairly current files. So you, you see that there is an issue of records practices in this whole matter. And that's why it's a matter of good governance as well, where Hong Kong people have lost out. So we do need to get to the root of why Hong Kong decides, Hong Kong, Hong Kong government has decided not to do something about this. And the last point I just want to make is, if we do not legislate, it means there's no recourse. And you'll see in this report, we did ask a number of government departments whether they had ever um, disciplined anyone. And you could see very well from the responses in our report that uh, this is not something that they really treat very seriously. So without a law, without officials taking it very seriously at the very highest level, we have many, many, many problems. Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Kun. I do not know uh, the academic as well as I know the previous speakers. Uh, he certainly has written many scholarly books and his life is now spent among the Hong Kong U archives because as I understand it, he is the director of the University of Hong Kong Centenary History Project and he is writing a definitive book about the University of Hong Kong's history. Uh, so he knows about the value of archives and he, here he is here to tell us. Thank you. Well, I, I think it was probably inevitable that the Archives Action Group would ask a, a historian to come and talk to you uh, as a representative of the scholarly community. Uh, and that's because the historians spend most of their lives in the archives. And uh, I am one of those people who gets excited, uh, Christine, about <laughs> old files uh, because I handle them and lovingly handle them, I should say, every day. And uh, we use them as the basis of, uh, of the work that we do as academics. I'm very much aware that it's not just historians, though, who work in archives. The point I want to make at the beginning of um, my few words is that academics from many other disciplines use the archives too. Political scientists, anthropologists, educationalists, lots of people from the social sciences. So this should not be a discussion that is limited just to historians who are dealing with long lost uh, examples of what's happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. There is a sense in which there are many uh, academics working on, uh, on these sorts of uh, issues. I'd also like to um, alert you to the fact that there has been a change in the character of scholarly endeavor over the last 20 or so years. And if you go to the National Archives in London, uh, you still see lots of academics who look like me working on their files. Uh, but you see an increasing number of members of the community who are doing amateur scholarship. And so what we find now is that public archives, and private archives for that matter, are a resource for the whole community, not just the scholarly community. So I, I take it on myself to uh, speak.
speak on behalf of the amateur scholarly community as well as the professional scholarly community. And what I want to do in, in the few minutes that we have today is talk first of all about the, the needs of the scholar uh, in an archive. And then I want to present, uh, if I can, a sort of a report card on where I feel Hong Kong is at the moment in terms of the provision of those services from the perspective of someone who has used the archives and uses them on a, uh, a regular basis. Well, there are different philosophical approaches to uh, the use of archives, and for historians, we tend to use the archive as our starting point with our research, and our work arises out of the archive. So the archives for us are very important. Uh, for social scientists, there's sometimes a, a more of a theoretical basis. So they, they have an idea and they go into the archive to prove or, or to prove it. So uh, we have slightly different approaches. Uh, but I think it doesn't matter really what our approach is or our, our philosophical uh, feeling about the, uh, the nature of the archive. Uh, there are certain things that we hold in common as being very important uh, as, as far as the archive is concerned. The first of these is the quality of the materials that are in the archive. Because the quality of our scholarly work relies very much on the quality of the documentation that we find within the archive. The standards that we use, or the standards that I use, the criteria for retention of those documents, uh, are criteria which have to be professionally agreed. Uh, there has to be some rationale retention. It's not just something that happens. You don't just shove a whole pile of documents into an archive. Uh, in fact, um, you know, there's, there's a very, um, there's a, it's a scholarly field in itself, archive management. And uh, so uh, it's not something that uh, just anyone can do. Uh, for me, it's very important to realize that it's not a political area either. We don't keep some documents because they're politically important or politically sensitive and chuck all of the others out. Um, if that were the case, we wouldn't have some of the most important archives that the historians use. Uh, I, I use the example of Frank Dakota, who's just written an excellent book on Mao's Great Famine. And that book would never have been allowed politically to have been written, uh, except that all of those archival documents were stored by the Chinese government, and uh, he was allowed to look at them. In my own field, uh, the um, trial of Thomas Cromwell was based on a huge trawl of documents in the 1540s, uh, the Ministry of Records, political records, personal records, uh, which were taken into the National Archives. And those records are the, the basis of most of the work that we've done on the Reformation in England, on the reign of Henry VIII. And these are documents that would not have survived if there was a, a political uh, motivation and had they been uh, sorted out on that basis. So it's important uh, for the archive to maintain the depth, the complexity of the original deposit, and of course that must be done by professionals. And if you ask the question, who should be doing this? I should be doing it as a historian. Uh, the person who has produced the archive and deposit, whoever they may be, a government department, a private individual, should not be deciding what is retained. It's a professional job, and professionals have to make that decision in order to provide the quality in the archive that we need as scholars. There's also the issue of quantity. And uh, some of you will be aware that Henry James once said that the historian essentially wants more documents than he can really use. And we do tend to be bound as we collect as much as we can, and we hardly ever get around to using them. And in this sense, I think historians and scholars in general are at odds with archivists because the job of the archivist is really to uh, work out what's important and throw away the rest. Uh, so an archivist will throw out between 75 and 90 percent of some deposits. So there, there is a sense in which we do have to get rid of things. And, and although that looks horrible, <laughs> that, uh, that IFC image that we've had, there is a need to get rid of records. But who should do it? It's a professional uh, who should do it, not someone who is not trained to do it. But the other issues I'd like to talk about, the other needs that we have, are first of all, and this is an obvious one, preservation. We need the highest standards of storage. Uh, we need uh, the documents to be protected from abuse while they're being used. There are lots of stories of the British Library 
Debris Bank and archives and things being cut in debris cases and taken off. Uh, so you need to protect the documents. Uh, there has to be minimal interference to the documents during the preservation process. Um, I always tell the story about the use of gall from oak trees in treating medieval manuscripts. It was a method used in the 19th century where you would rub this stuff onto the manuscript and it would immediately bring out the faded uh, ink that was used on the document. But you could only read it once. After you read it, it would go black. <laughs> so there is a science to the preservation of these important documents. And once again, that is a professional job. It's not something that can be done by amateurs. The issue of accessibility is very important for historians and scholars. We need to be able to have access to these documents. And we all understand that there are limits to this. In the British context, it's a 30-year rule, soon to come down to 20 or 25 years. Documents are put away, and no one has access to them for a certain number of years. And we all work under that assumption that that is something we have to work by. But when they come out of that 30-year rule, we want to be able to see all of the documents that have been preserved, except those that are uh, banned because of national security. But there are very few of those documents. So accessibility of those documents must be, uh, must be preserved. But we need proper reading facilities. We need to have a, a place where we can go, where there's good light, where there's a microfilm, uh, reader if we need it with us, with all those facilities. We need to have professional assistance, so there needs to be a staff there. Uh, we need to have reliable finding aids, a catalogue. Uh, we need to have people who have some sort of institutional memory, because using a catalogue doesn't tell us everything that we need about the archive. We need to be able to say, someone told me that there's a document about this or about that, where can I find it? So there needs to be an institutional memory within any archive organisation which assists the scholar. Now, I could go on, but I'm not. Um, I think those are enough areas to indicate the sorts of things that scholars need in terms of an archive. How is Hong Kong performing at the moment from my point of view as a user of, uh, of the archives? Well, if uh, our government representative was here tonight, I'd be able to turn to him or her and say that in my experience of using the PRO here in Hong Kong, um, I've had very good experiences because we do have a good facility there. And in the work that I've been doing on the history of the University of Hong Kong, I've been able to find a, a huge range of documents there that have been very important to uh, fill in the gaps that we have here in the archival record within the university. Now, as most people know, uh, there was a lot of archival destruction during the Second World War in Hong Kong. Uh, but we're blessed in Hong Kong because, in a sense, that doesn't matter. There are copies of all those documents in London. So we can go to the National Archives in London and we can read all the pre-war records. Now, unfortunately, what that does for anyone working on Hong Kong history is to raise the bar very high because the National Archives is one of the best archives in the world. And if we're able to study the pre-war history of Hong Kong in such depth and in such good facilities and with complete access to all the documents, then when we come to examining the post-war history of Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, using the public record office and the documents that have been culled from uh, the Hong Kong government records, we expect the same sort of standards. So, this places a very high expectation government record service. Now, what I would say as a user is that our preservation and storage standards are very high in Hong Kong. They were stated the art when they were put in, and I think that dealing with problems of humidity, tropical vermin, all of those awful things that get into your records, uh, we're pretty well set up here in Hong Kong. So, so 100% for the government on, on, this, on this side. I think also access is very good. 30-year rule applies here. Uh, we have good reading rooms, we have long opening hours at the public record office. Not many people use it, um, and there are reasons for that, but we do have a very good facility there. Uh, the assistance that you get at the, record, the public records office is also very good, but I'm not sure about that issue of institutional memory. Sometimes you ask a question and um, people don't know, because I think in a sense there are, it's not that 
uh, depth of professionalism that you might get in London. What about the quality and the quantity of the records? Well, in the case of the Hong Kong U history, uh, I can say that uh, as far as the colonial secretary's office, the chief secretary's office is concerned, a full run of the records exist in the, the PRO up until 1995. So I, can, I can't consult all of those because of the 30-year rule, but I know what's there. And I can, um, I can look at the National Archive records and I can see where the counterparts exist between the Hong Kong records and the, uh, and the London records. In terms of student union records, they only go up to 1992 for some reason. And I would have thought that something as sensitive as student union, would there would probably be more files, but after 1992 they're not there, or they're not on the catalogue at least. I can't find any land records relating to the university. And perhaps they're still in a government department, but land records from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, perhaps should be stored somewhere else other than a government department. Uh, the UGC, the University Grants Committee, uh, 123 files can be found in the Public Record Office, uh, the latest of them from 1985, but most of them are before 1980. And I suspect this is another ICAC example. Uh, but it is not a government institution, it is independent, and so perhaps, I don't know, are those documents going to come to the Public Records Office eventually or not? I'm not sure. What about the other departments that deal with education? What about the Education and Manpower Bureau? I found no records relating to the university in the PRO from the Education and Manpower Bureau. Where are they? Some of these gaps, I think, are quite inexplicable. Why is it that some departments don't archive their records at the PRO? Where do they keep their old records? Do they maintain them in a proper state? Uh, what conditions are they kept in? And who's held, who ultimately is held responsible for those records? I don't know. But I have nagging doubts that without an archives law, uh, we can't be sure of the answers to these very basic questions. So from a scholarly point of view, uh, I too share the worries that, uh, that my colleagues have, that we really do need to have something that is going to ensure that government provides us in Hong Kong with the same level of record and care uh, that uh, exists in those other jurisdictions which we had up on the screen. Thank you very much. He is a monster of well painted to me. Uh, he, he, he comes so highly recommended that uh, for those of you who uh, listen to Chinese radio, he is, of course, a household man. And uh, I understand he's not only in charge of the commercial radio, but he has his uh, most popular programs. Um, I'm very honored to be here today, um, but I'm also very anxious, especially when I'm the one who speaks right after a scholar. And as a media person, maybe my speech was deemed to be shallow in that sense. Um, this uh, Hong Kong U staff members uh, asked me to go to the centenary Hong Kong U concert tonight with Kissing playing Beethoven, I think. And then when I told her that I have a much more important meeting to go instead of listening to Kissing, then she asked me um, what am I going to talk about. I, I said, archives law. And her reply, short one minor, you can speak on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, for some of you who uh, may know, uh, I was on the other side before I joined uh, the radio, before I joined the media industry. I was from the dark side. I was an administrative officer of the Hong Kong Administrative, Special Administrative Region Government. So I was throwing away files. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, it's not my decision, it's a command from my superior. I was asked today to speak about media and access to information, and actually what we have today is, when we talk about the government, is media and blocking access to information. Um, it's always a hide-and-seek game when the government is dealing with the media. They try to give you minimum information. 
I was told by the same superior who asked me to throw away files, uh, who told me an AO would give out minimum information that satisfies the logical question. But a good AO, however, give out minimum information that satisfy one more follow-up question. And that's it. Of course, uh, none of what I've just said can be found because the record has been thrown away. I was trying to uh, jot it down and put it in file and my superior just pulled out that piece of paper and threw it in front of me because we don't have the archives law. Um, Christine has just, just said that the problem starts to accumulate uh, since 2007, it seems. And it was the year when Donald Trump starts to expand the political appointment system. And this is very true when I speak to my former colleagues who were still AOs in the government, that uh, nowadays they uh, keep very bad records compared to my days, which is only about 15 years ago. Uh, there are more emails, and the emails were deleted. Some of them were not printed. And it is now very difficult to follow the logic of any policy form formulated the states. And um, when I talk about the key is minimum, I would like to show you the... Uh, does anyone go to the Code of SS website? Does anyone go to this? This is the standard format, right? When I talk about the minimum, the government actually do the min does the minimum. Have you ever seen such an ugly website? And this is the code, this is the access to government information website. This is the most ugly website. The ugliest website of all the government websites. And because they're only doing the minimum. Um, they also want to only give out the minimum information because it's also binary to media. Because if you be frank with senior government officials, you have access to some confidential information prior to other media before they get it. And this is the way it works in the government right now. However, as Margaret and as all of us know today, the issue is never sexy. I mean, to the public, it's always very difficult and it's uh, extremely difficult, I would say, to get to the point where they would have the same enthusiasm like the scholar over there. It's very difficult to ask our, our, our general public to love files like you. Um, but I would like to think that there must be some way to make this issue more juicy, more sexy, more appealing to the public. And that's what I have been doing with Christine, with Margaret, with Emily Lau, with Simon, with a lot of us here, to try to get uh, this, have, uh, to try to get the public to have more attention to this. And I was thinking we, we lack something. We lack a nemesis to the government files. We need analysis because once we have this devil, then the public will be more easier to, to, to attack, to criticize. And Margaret, you just remind me, because you left out one case about uh, the importance of files, is Henry Tan changing the minutes of meetings on, on Harvard Fest. So Henry Tan can be the nemesis of all the government files. And I think a lot of us hate him, right? <laughs> and he has an evil twins, which is currently the chief secretary of the administration, called Stephen Lamb. So I think this evil twins can be a very good nemesis when we're trying to explain who does not allow Hong Kong to have uh, the archives law. I think when we try to explain to the public, we should pin them down because they are the devils. They are the devils who change government records. They are the, the devils who throw away files. They are the devils who say no. They are the devils who uh, lobby the pro establishment to vote abstain in such an important motion, uh, which Margaret has uh, raised last week. But this is not enough. I think besides the evil twins, I think we also need to tie in the, 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 the issue with a few things, which I would throw it up as uh, food for thought for all of you. I think we also need to tie in with the mainland. Um, because do remember there are 13 or 14 abstain votes? 17. 17 abstain votes. And these are the pro-establishment camp. And we should try to get the votes and we should try to get them to vote yes. And I think 
And, and a much easier way is that you tell them that um, the grandfather is doing this. They have very grand facilities. I was invited by Simon to go to see the archive museum or the archive. Provincial archive in Guangzhou. The, the provincial in Guangzhou. archive in Guangzhou. And it was like 16 story high with all the facilities that you want, all kinds of lamp. Uh, you can even change the colors of the lamp if you want to read different records. And, but we don't have that in Hong Kong. And, but they have, all, they have these facilities in the mainland. I think if Margaret can raise the, another motion, that we should say, should Hong Kong follow mainland's footstep in establishing archives law? And when the pro-establishment camp say follow China, then they will automatically just vote yes without <laughs> regarding the rest of your motion, right? right. <laughs> um, and so, uh, um, we also need to tie in with the political appointment system. And I think without an archives law, there is no political appointment system which, is, uh, which can hold the, uh, the senior officials responsible. Now I think we should appeal to the AOs because when they try to, and they possibly will, further expand the political appointment system uh, with the entrance of the next CE, I think we should alert the AOs, we should remind them that without an archives law, you are in grave dangers. Because those political appointees will just throw away their responsibility, throw away your files, throw away your logics. But when they face us, when they face the media, they will say it's your fault. So I think we need the archives law to protect them, and we should remind them, and we should lobby them. Finally, I think um, to tie in with the Hong Kong public, it's always easy to try to tie in any issues with the dollar sign. So I think with files power three IFCs too high, I think we should ask how much time and how much money has been spent in preparing those files. Ask them for man hours. Ask them for how much money has been spent, how much public money has been spent in preparing those files. And these are the public money they just threw away in the past few years. So I will leave it like that, and hopefully you will have better ideas than just throwing bananas to the evil twins. Thank you. <laughs> well, now is the fun part, I hope. The fun part is, we are going to have a discussion. Now, there are many ways of doing this, uh, but I thought that uh, we reached the stage that Vincent suggested last, because I think we should be looking at what is the present system and understand how it compares with the rest of the world and what are its deficiencies? No point in merely saying Henry Kang is an idiot, or is wrong, although we have approached him with our drop bill, we asked for appointment, he did not even see us. Uh, he was given the drop bill, not interested. But we should be looking at each subject matter separately. So this is my suggestion, and I hope and that uh, you would tell me uh, if I am going about the wrong way. Now, I want to start first with budget. Hong Kong, as I understand it, we've been spending, and uh, don't uh, help me on this, uh, we have spent something like 30 million a year on the archives. And in fact, the figure has been going down. And, uh, and this is to compare with, in Australia, they spent something like 150 million. In America, they spent something like uh, 500 million, 3.3 billion. So, so with that kind of a tiny budget, it comes to next week manpower and the quality of manpower. And the quality of manpower is very clearly, and I, what I'd like to do is ask all of you to look at this uh, wonderful document that I prepared 
on how public records are managed by the or as a government. Uh, assertions and reality. Because the assertion and reality is on the one hand, the government says, oh, we're doing fine. We have got all the adequate people and so on. But is that the reality? Uh, I, I like Uh, I'd like to be able to tell you how uh, the government have, I think, two uh, among some subtly stuff in the GRS. They now have six so-called archivist stuff, but only two have professional qualifications. And now, that those two have uh, the head, so to speak, was um, set by, I think, Steve uh, Lamb uh, to have the uh, right kind of professional qualification, but apparently uh, she does not. Now, how therefore do we expect with that paucity of professional expertise? for them to undertake in the most critical role, as I understand, in the market, as, as said by Professor Kuhn, is appraisal. Without the ability to appraise documents properly, and that's with professional training, there is a no way you can then decide what is to be retained and what is going to be destroyed. And that is the key. So, the result is, of course, wholesale destruction, as we have seen. The, the tr triple uh, I have. So, so, I think that's, that's a starting point of what's wrong. Uh, I mean, we will be coming to, uh, I hope, uh, the different uh, part of the audit report. Because I think the proper way of doing it is starting with looking at the budget and the staff, then the system, then the management records, then the preservation storage, is access, and discuss each and find out your views on its adequacy or inadequacy. Uh, I, I don't know whether that is a proper way of doing it. Um, do you have any view, first of all, about the budget and the quality of the staff? Can I be devil's advocate? I'm not sure the budget matters in the slightest at the moment, because if I understand it, they're not being given the chance to review the documents. So you can have all the people you wanted. If they don't get access to the documents, it makes no difference at all. So unless it's that they're unable to uh, physically handle the archiving of the documents they already have, I don't think the budget is the primary issue. The, the budget is evidence of the government's commitment to archives. Now, with well, we archives, already know the answer to that. No, the, the, uh, with the archives law, then there is, there is no choice but to have the sufficient allocation of funds to do the job properly. Many people, including my uh, clever friend Christine, asked. She said she couldn't understand why uh, the government refuses to consider archive law. I think the answer is very simple, Christine, and you know it only you don't accept it. Which is that they know the power of an archive law. The archive law has two implications. First, it imposes a legal obligation. Secondly, it obliges government to come up with resources in order to meet their legal obligations. For example, if the law says that all government departments must have the right staff to uh, manage their records, then government must budget for such staff. And they must hire these people. Now, um, to about... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, 
appraising the records. According to the summary, only the summary of the audit report, there are 280,000 documents which remain unappraised. Uh, and these are the historical archives already collected by the government archive service uh, uh, people. So uh, that is why. It, I think it is simply because the government understands how powerful law can be. I mean, uh, a broken down as the SAR government is, it seems that they have not completely broken down, and that's a problem. They realize that the law means that they have to come up with the manpower, they have to come up with the money, and they are susceptible to judicial review. And this is what they don't want to see. So, so I think, uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, budget is secondary to law, because if you have the law, they will come up with a budget. If they don't have the law, it, 30 million will become 25 very soon. Yes, because why would they give all the resources? The, the, the lack of the funding is merely the evidence of their contempt for the archives. Now, uh, I, I should tell you that uh, in the draft bill, uh, which is set out uh, in an article I wrote for the Hong Kong lawyer, we have provided clearly criminal sanction. Criminal sanction ranging from 100,000 fine to any person who breaches the law, any part of the law, up to 200,000 and, and imprisonment of 12 months to 24 months. Now, this is giving teeth to whoever is, and we set up the Archives Authority, which is a statutory authority, with power to compel every single department, every single officer from the chief secretary, chief executive down to comply with the law. Yeah. So, can I play, uh, not definitely, I'm very, I'm definitely anxious advocate. Can I just ask people who are, who are sacrificing their time this evening, from their own job perspective or their own interests, do they care about having archives, an archive law in Hong Kong. What would it mean to them? I see, you know, Mark Derek, who is a very senior member of the media. Does it mean anything to them? Or has the media also uh, come to a point where records can be of no assistance to, to them because nobody is interested to find out from objective sources? difficult sources, what the real state of affairs is. I, I'd like to hear from everybody. I mean, we are all, all very fired up when, I, when, when you talk about record and files and, and uh, things like tax collection or shipping uh, 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 schedules and things. I got very exciting. I think I must be crazy. I was appointed, so I say something. I think um, media have more frustration experience than ordinary people to find that what they would or should have in the archive has lost. Um, the most recent case, I think, um, a reporter from the SCMP has told me that he had asked the, the government how much money has been paid to clear the way in new territories for reasons and he was she was told by uh, one department that uh, the record was in another department so she called that department and that department told her that they don't keep this record and then when she go back to the, um, the original department then the department said that the record has been destroyed so you can see that you can do the the department people will just tell you from one place to another just to um, switch off their responsibility, and that uh, that is one of the case. And the other case I um, think is when the um, dated milk powder oh. took place in um, mainland, 
and I remember the reporter tried to get record um, the result. Actually, it should not be an archive at that time, but still, it is it's record, right? So they want to have it from the um, depart health, health department or the um, and food and environment department, but then the department said that they don't have this figure. So um, we now we have to use the uh, a tactic that the, to use some other department or statutory body to get the record. So I remember at that time the reporter went to the, um, the commissioner, go to the ombudsman and you know, complain that they cannot get it. And so after the ombudsman asking from asking the department whether they have the record or not, then we have the record. So you can see that there is lots of trouble or frustrative experience media have when they're trying to get some, digging out some facts. And I'm afraid that the government know that tactic too. So they try to get control of the sources of information and that's why um, when the uh, Hong Kong Journalist Association launched uh, a campaign almost 20 years, uh, 15 years ago with Christine Noh about you know, asking the government to have access to information bill. And the government only um, gave, us, gave us a cope of access to information. And definitely we would like to have a bill, as you said. A, a statutory obligation is important then that the officials will do it. So that's why I think archive is important. And without archive, as, um, um, access to information law will be, and, and will be empty because we don't have archive to access anyway. So these two law is important and definitely it should go hand in hand to push the government to embody the right to know of the people. Otherwise, people will do not have archives to look at, historians do not have a record to study, and definitely the result is that the right to know of people will deteriorate dramatically. Uh, yes. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Clement. I'm a PhD student in Hong Kong Youth. I have very similar feelings with uh, many just now. And actually, I am studying freedom of information law in the mainland. So I, I have a feeling that maybe when we call for an archive law, we should also call for a freedom of information law in parallel. Well, especially for the public, when they have interest in the accessibility of information, they might have more interest in the information of now, not the information of the past. So if these two laws go in parallel, they that may, um, how do you say, encourage more uh, public interest in this issue. And I just heard that um, might be as a strategy, maybe it is useful to uh, send to the uh, whole establishment legislator that we should follow the case of the mainland in uh, making an archive law. I don't think that's a good, uh, <laughs> good case because the archive law in China is, uh, has invested huge discretion to the archive authorities so they can deny the access of the public whenever they uh, deem it appropriate. And even after China has adopted the regulation on somehow freedom of information, there is an inconsistency between the archive law and the new FOI regulation. So the government sometimes use the archive law as an exit as an excuse to deny disclosure. When they publish some document or policy, they at the same time will uh, send those documents to the archive. So once those documents was archived in the archive uh, library or something, then you cannot get access to those documents because they, they are governed by the archive law. So if we do not resolve the possible inconsistency between the freedom of information law and archive law, that might 
that might raise some unexpected um, obstructs to, to our access flight. Thank you. I'm just suggesting a way to get my resolution passed. Of course, when you get to the Bills Committee, you can get into the details, and especially on how to access the information. I think, I think having the two bills in parallel, maybe we should incorporate, if we have a chance to put it into the Bills Committee, maybe we should incorporate access information in the archives law. Uh, let, let me add some background to this because uh, when I was in Mexico, I tried to push for two things. One was uh, a piece of uh, access to information uh, ordinance, uh, as well as a sunshine law. And I, mean, I, I think it's, uh, that you, you can see these as a package. So you definitely protect the records and you archive them, you provide access, and then in situations where meetings are taking place, you allow access to certain meetings so you can witness actually what's happening. Now, at the time, uh, before the year 2000, when I, when I was in Benchco, there was an interest amongst members of Benchco to at least allow the space to raise and discuss these issues. Um, it was really through, I think, public sympathy, legislative support of the principle of uh, FOI that the government provided a compromise at the time to, you know, to have an access uh, to information code. Uh, and at that time, the Chief Secretary at that time made a public statement that uh, changing, uh, that the, the access code would change government's culture. <laughs> yes, and she pleaded, so you know who it is, she pleaded that we gave the government time to switch into this new culture. But of course, over the years, uh, it has actually become harder and harder for people in the community, uh, whether they're historians, or whether they're members of the uh, media, ordinary members of the public, uh, definitely legislators, <coughs> to actually reopen these discussions and be able to say, well, you know, it's now 15 years since we ha first had those public discussions. Now the issue about China is, China accepts the principle. What they do is, through uh, details, uh, they will have a lot of discretions uh, to block you off here and there. There's no argument about the principle. And what's different in Hong Kong with, for example, archives, which the Chinese never argue about that. And they're quite shocked, in fact, Hong Kong doesn't have archives law. Uh, we are having a problem with the principle. Yes. And there is a, the, you know, so we can't even get to first phase to say if we're going to have a law, okay, you know, where are the compromises that needs to be made? Yes. We can't get to first phase. Can, can I say this? Yeah. My feeling is that this is a fortress mentality. They are so afraid that therefore they have to erect this huge structure to say no because. They fear that if there is a breach, then once you start the dialogue, there's no way they can stop. Uh, no, people, uh, just one minute. Huh? Uh, I know Lentro is very boring, but please spend some time on Lentro because you have no idea what is going on. Read Christine's Annex 2 on page 2. This is Paul Jess' uh, amendment. Basically, he says all we have to do is to improve the present system and not to uh, uh, introduce archive law. He did not post my motion in, in the end, but this is what he said. And, the speech, and he said in his speech, one of the things that he said was, according to Tony Blair, the worst decision he had made was to have introduced Freedom of Information Act, and he, Paul, confused the archive law with Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information, access to information, is the reason why my colleagues abstain from supporting archive law. And they don't feel any qualms telling you this. It will be very inconvenient, they say, if you preserve public records and then allow people to access them because there are a lot of bad people around in Hong Kong and they will make trouble if you allow them to. So, obviously,
maybe we should change the terminology a little, William. Maybe we shouldn't call ourselves the archive group. We should say public record group because people have the idea that archive must be very old. But in fact, uh, you know, if you start to uh, create a, 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 a public records and preserve them, they should be a lot of them should be available right now. Yeah. John. Yes, I'd like to go back to Christine's report, recommendation number one. This recommendation is whose property are the public records? The public records are the property of the public. Yes. And as soon as you establish that point, everything else goes away. That's the point the government denies. The government says the public records do not belong to the public. And you put this as recommendation number one. I would say it is absolutely the bedrock of all the rest. How do we then go and achieve that objective? Because, because I, I think all of us here agree that we, the system does not work. That we need go. How do we go about Obtaining the objective. Well, I, I think we can draw the analogy. I don't know if it works, but with the, the day of protection law, the personal day of protection law, that went through very smoothly at the same time Christine was arguing for access to information. Because the business community thought it was a good idea. It protected them against the risk of getting cut off from information from Europe. So I, I really think we should try and think of a way to sell this to business to say, look, this is this is the right thing to do from your perspective to protect you. If we can find a way to do that, then the whole game will change. Because at the moment they're able to persuade all the functional constituency people, yeah, this you know, you must protect us. Why? Why should they protect civil servants from the consequences of bad decisions? That's really what they're saying. Can can I give you a, the reason behind this? Hong Kong's dominated, dominated by the property tycoons. Property tycoons have a secret understanding with government. Do you think property tycoons would like to have public records preserved so that these secret views or understandings will become public? I therefore view, view our deterioration for Hong Kong as stemming from the total change of Hong Kong from a society which behaves in a civilized way to a society which is dominated by tycoons working in close collusion with the government. And that's why we have this present situation. They will never agree to having archives closed if you, if you want the support of the business community. Yes. yes Hello, um, I'm a uh, member of the Digital 21 the Strategy Advisory Committee and we are working on the open government data policies. Um, I, my, my feeling is that this whole um, archives law is, is highly politicized. Also here, I'm at Hong Kong U and I'm just hearing very strong opinions and I wonder why we cannot discuss this in a frame the problem a little bit different and I think archive law is just a little piece of general public information management and that includes data, data uh, privacy and uh, access to information, all the other laws. So now we are kind of focusing on this archives law only, but forgetting the whole, the whole, and that, that is public information management. And if you look at practices in, in, uh, in Europe, you don't frame this just as archive law. I think we are just getting, we are politicizing the issue and therefore it's kind of a dead end for me. It's not the broader scope of but, what but is the archive important. law yeah. is the starting point. Why is it you, you point? don't even get to preservation. How do you even get to access to information? Well, I'm not sure if it's a starting point. Maybe we should start from somewhere else because this is already so disputed. And then um, I think it's also um, a problem that um, you mentioned that the access, or one of the speakers mentioned that the access to government information site is the most boring website. But the government record service is maybe the second boring. And I wonder <laughs> why the people who work in the government record service have not used the past de decades to make public records more community issue. Why did they not try to, to educate the public on why, why records are important? There's nothing happening. This is a dead department. Can I just make a comment here? The reason why records law, archives law is vital is because only with the law do you ensure that records are created and managed properly in the first place. All government information depends on public information services that you're talking about. It depends on good record people in the first place. To 
But your second point as to why the government record service didn't make better use of its website, Proclam advocated uh, issues of this kind simply because it's not led by professionals. <coughs> the senior person, the government record service director for many years, has been a non-professional. He's occupying a professional position, which previously she was occupying a professional position. But they're principal executive officers who've been posted in for three years, don't care about the, the subject, don't know anything about the subject, would do exactly what the administrative officers tell them, and move on after three years. And, and unless you have a law which requires professional staffing, starting with the head of the records organisation, you'll never have any further development. Can, can I just add this? To give uh, some idea of the quality of what Don Gregg has just said, he was the former director in charge of archives. We have amongst our, our, our group, Don Gregg, former director in charge of archives, we have uh, um, uh, Simon Chu, again, a former director in charge of archives. They are part of our group because they felt that our system is in danger. And that's why. Now, I'd like to have your views as to whether the way ahead is through political or non-political. Can I just add one point? I think, um, thanks for your opinion, but I think when we talk, when we are talking about the Hong Kong government, it's very difficult for them to fix big things because they never fix big things. They don't think in principles. So that's why we have to limit our scope and focus only on public records. And this is a more pragmatic way, at least, to try to preserve the records. And we don't want to politicize things, but this is a political issue. We are talking about responsibility of senior officials in Hong Kong. So this is political by nature. I, I think we are talking about principles here, and I think we're also talking about culture. If you ask the question, why does China have such a strong archives law, it's because there has been a traditional fetish in China for record keeping. Why do the US and the UK have good archive laws? It's all about open government. And the problem in Hong Kong is that we have neither of those cultures. <laughs> we fall somewhere in between. There is no culture which forces us to have an archives. That's why we have a boring archives website, because no one cares. So what we have to do is to try and create a culture, and I, I can't see any other way of doing it, apart from educating a lot of archivists and getting our students to go out there, other than using political action to do it. And I really do think that even though we academics don't like to get involved in politics, that there comes a point where uh, we're just talking at phrases in the air if we're, if we're not prepared to actually uh, take political action. Anyway, um, my name is Stacy, and I'm the archivist here at Hong Kong U. And um, a little earlier we were talking about, you know, what could we do to make this more appealing to the public? Um, how could we make archives a little bit more sexy? And um, and my first thought that, that popped into my head was, okay, let's talk about let's talk about something sexy. Let's talk about dirty, sexy money, because that's what it comes down to. When we mishandle our records, when we are not accountable, when we hire people who are not professional to run the record system in our government, they're spending our money. It's my tax money. It's your tax money. It's the money we hand to the government every year, year after year. It's our money. They have their hands in our pockets. We have a right to know what they're doing with their fingers. And we have a right, I think, to know as, as citizens of Hong Kong what, what decisions are being made, what the evidence is. It's, <laughs> this is very basic stuff. And, um, you know, I maybe I don't think I'm the only person in the room who gets excited about money. You know? <laughs> and, and I and I think that that may be a way for us to talk about this. When we have poor records management, whether it's in a business or a school or a government, we are wasting money. You know, we're spending it foolishly. It's disappearing, and there's no explanation. 
And then perhaps we can talk about some of the other things that won't come home to roost until, you know, the next generation, and that is we're losing our history. You know, that, that big pile of records measured up against the IFC, there's no getting that back. Once those documents are gone, they're gone. You know, when you go to the hospital authority and you ask to find the records of your birth parents and they say, we don't know what happened. Sorry. Now, if you were in any other country and you were 18 years old, you would have a right in the UK or in the US to go to the hospital or the health authority there and say, I want to see the record of my birth parents. But that young man who asked in Hong Kong to see the record of his parents got told, we don't know what happened. But so Stacy, yeah. yeah. So. Maybe don't keep it for more than seven. It's ridiculous. But but it, I think the critical question is of what would get the people of Hong Kong angry, angry enough to take right. political action. Yes. <laughs> I'm hearing a number of different strands here, and I think each one of those strands possibly help us to think this through. I don't necessarily think there is a single message that is going to work for everybody. Um, and everybody has said something that I think is perhaps more or less persuasive to different groups of people in Hong Kong. Now, what I'm hearing from Walter at the back is, you know, uh, this is we can talk about this very dispassionately. We can talk about this in terms of records management, and there's a natural flow, and all of that. And you know, we're going to digitalize everything. It's about ICT management. And I think that message makes complete sense to some people. Not everybody, but complete sense to some people. Now, the passion, you know, the historians, the, the, the scholars, that makes complete sense to certain other people. The lawyers and the passion, you know, the uh, 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 the feeling that maybe we have to politicize it, right, and, and organize marches and so on. It appeals to some other people, but completely not to other people. So, I mean, of course, underlying it all, one thing that we do all agree on is, well, how do we how do we just explain the details and get them more excited? So, I think what I'm saying is, I don't think there's one single message, a way of doing it. Um, there is something about just keep doing it, and you need different groups of people who understand the issue, who come from different perspectives, who speak a different language, to use their way to, to to kind of fill out the kaleidoscope of views. But the difficulty is how do you make archives and archives look, which is very dry academic. Well, the, the issue is sexy and interesting to people so that they would even want to understand. Now, freedom of information became more interesting 15 years ago. Sunshine, the, the idea of sunshine law never really quite caught on. Archives law is kind of coming into this, and it's got a natural partnership with FOI. Now, I'm not sure, I mean, you know, as I said, I've kind of tried to whip this all up myself. I'm not sure um, we've done actually very good jobs in thinking of the different ways of explaining all of this and building coalitions. We need to build coalitions with other groups who can articulate it in different ways and then they do it all over the place. Now, Vincent will probably be able to confirm this. There are some things that there's, there's a natural process in society when when there's kind of enough traction, enough people are at least thinking about it, that it becomes a public consensus. Well, uh, I've been involved in one or two things where this happened, you know, the protection of the harbor. When we started, people said, look, you know, reclamation, this is what we've grown up with. And there are other issues as well that people come towards. It. So what what is that groundswell that we do? You can see Vincent comes from a completely different place. Right? And and his ideas may be extremely uncomfortable for certain people. Uh, Walter's very calm, cool, and uh, collective way maybe to many people are devoid of the passion. You know, maybe we don't really truly understand the principles. Therefore, we can kind of just treat this as a technical issue. Uh, but the reality is, people in society are compelled by different arguments. Well, certainly, we Vin Vincent has pointed to 
one group of allies, the civil servants, because it's for their natural protection of the work they do that they want our country all. But their difficulty is they have their masters overlook their shoulders. But they have unions. Huh? Huh? They have unions. Yeah, but let, what uh, I'm saying is, yes. how do we build coalitions, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that for some reason, maybe it's purely a matter of perception, I am probably the most political person in this room. Yeah. Right. Anyone wants to compete with me? <laughs> I ended my speech in Lenchko, my very last by saying that this is an issue for the community. I call upon the teachers to look after our archives so that we have something for our children. And some of the speeches in that debate are coming from the pro-government groups. Talked about um, the archive uh, that uh, Peter was talking about, that teachers brought their children to their students to uh, uh, read them and they were very interested. And I think that there is a soft approach to it. I have always tried to tell the AAG that uh, because I'm political and you don't want to be seen to be a political movement, so, you know, uh, maybe you don't want me to come up too close. Right? And interestingly, the AAG has now arrived at a position when they consider that some political action is necessary. And why is that? Because you can go softly and softly only up to a certain point. The, the trouble with archive law is not that people are not convinced that it is a good thing, but that there is enough, there is not enough of a push for government to really give it priority. Uh, and so, uh, and I also agree with Peter, that you are either passionate about accountability, archive as a profession, or you have the sort of cultural love. And I, I am really astonished because we are Chinese. Chinese Confucian culture it thinks that uh, 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 anything written is sacred. And, but somehow we have lost that. So, you know, my view is that um, we are not doing very badly. Uh, because from one or two people seemingly uh, are very uh, sort of big crusaders, we now have more and more people interested in, let's say, public records, historical uh, records, the law and access to information from different points of view. And maybe what the, the people in this room should do, including the Archive Action Group, is to uh, build this coalition that Christine suggests, that we open up, that there may be some people who are interested in the political arena so that the, the, the matter is always on the public agenda, when are we going to have it? But we also have it on the education agenda, we also have it on the academic agenda, we also have it on community agenda. Uh, Peter is right about another thing, people start, you start to have amateur uh, historians. Now, one of the groups are uh, the conservation people, who people who want to keep government hill, you know, and, and I start to see them digging up not very old uh, uh, journal, uh, architectural journal, showing uh, um, uh, articles of the time when, the, when West Wing was built, and people got terribly interested, because Hong Kong people are becoming more interested in backgrounds of things, in, in the history of buildings, in the history of Hong Kong's development, to an extent that we were not when we were young. So maybe, William, you know, I mean, we should do all, all that. Yes, I'd like to, I'd yes. like to say, can I just follow up on both what Christine and Margaret have said? Uh, my name is Nelly Fung, and I'm also part of the um, Archive Action Group. I got involved in this really as an amateur historian. Um, I came to live in Hong Kong in 1967, and I'm from Philippines, and I've seen its development, and I really now, this is my home, and I've identified very much with Hong Kong, and my children have been born here. I'm proud of Hong Kong and everything that it's achieved, and I think the heritage of Hong Kong is terribly important, and the heritage and culture of our city and of our citizens is something that needs to be protected and to be valued. I'm really happy to see that 
the heritage movement now is protecting buildings. It's talking about it's now it's now recognized the historical value of what's left of the harbor. But but all of, and all of these things are so important. And when we talk about the law, the law needs to protect our heritage and our culture. As as uh, as, uh, as William was saying, if documents are lost, once they're lost, they're gone. You cannot recreate them. Buildings that we're now trying to, to protect and list and heritage, but if we don't know what went on in these buildings, if we don't know who, who, who worked there, if we don't know the dramas that took place in these buildings, they're empty shells. I just come back from um, a trip to Germany, which and to East Germany, which was devastated um, during World War II. It has been reconstructed. A lot of people are visiting Germany and many other countries. And why do people come to visit these places? Why do Tourists go from Hong Kong, from China, to, to other countries in Asia and in Europe, but to visit their historical sites and to value their, their history and to learn about it. You can't do this if you don't preserve your heritage, if you don't preserve your documents, if you don't preserve the letters, the memos that people have written. Um, I think, for example, the handover of Hong Kong uh, to China in 1997, that is a very, very unique event in history. It's not happened anywhere, anytime, to any other people where a colony was handed back to, to its mother country with no, with no violence, with no revolution, nothing. That was wonderful. When I went to visit the PRO and I asked them, it's over 10 years since the handover. Do you have the records of the chief executive of the first 10 years of the, of, of the SAR? They said, no. And I said, well, where are they? I mean, when one day someone wants to read about what happened, what was the drama, who spoke to who, who said what, where are these documents? They said, I don't know. I mean, that, that to me is such a tragedy. How can our future citizens be proud of Hong Kong, know where they're coming from, know where they want to go, if these documents are not preserved? And if, if, there's no, if, if they can get lost, because there's no law to preserve them, what do we have for our future? So that's where I'm coming from, and I'm, I'm quite passionate about it from the cultural and heritage point of view. Nick? Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Nick Frisch. I wrote the report um, for Civic Exchange, and um, uh, I don't have much value to add here as someone who's uh, deeply familiar with archives or who's lived in Hong Kong for a long time or as an amateur historian. Actually, I'm probably uh, of all the people in this room, uh, the least interested in archives. Um, but I did have um, a, a few three months to hang around the Civic Exchange office and do a lot of research. Um, so I think in that way, uh, I hope that uh, an outsider perspective uh, will be a little bit useful uh, to tie together uh, some of the ideas that we've talked about in terms of coalition building and the different people who have an interest in document preservation, even if they don't realize it. Um, and so uh, on our report, and around page 35 and 36, um, there's a very long list of uh, some of the news stories that have uh, whipped up quite a lot of attention in Hong Kong. You know, there's always a controversy uh, every day about something and how, uh, at root, a lot of these are about records when you get down to it. Um, approximately, the issue appears to be about people who don't have the right title to their land or people who are dealing with a medical error or people who got crushed by falling trees, or people who lost their tax dollars in feng shui or whatever. But as long as there are uh, lost records at the base of it, um, trying to make people more aware of how and why they have a stake in good records management uh, is, I think, something you could do in terms of public outreach and making the public feel like they have a stake in the issue. The other thing you can do is drive the point um, that Hong Kong is not really serving its international partners very well. So. Uh, we're trying to raise the issue out of the local press. So, for example, tomorrow we're running um, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, Asia to try and raise the issue to more of a regional issue. Um, that ties into some of the things that uh, Stacy said, you know, the money angle. Uh, and specifically, uh, Hong Kong sort of, Hong Kong's obsession with money and also with efficiency. Uh, if you want to look at an example like Singapore, uh, the recently retired director of the National Archives in Singapore uh, came to Hong Kong two years ago for a seminar uh, held by Civic Exchange and could give us the exact dollar savings 
uh, precise figures of the dollar savings and also the environmental impact, or rather the reduced environmental impact, of having a good uh, records policy. And Singapore, by the way, does not have a freedom of information law, uh, but it does have a records act. And so while um, I suppose there is a temptation on the one hand to sort of go protesting in the streets, um, and some people might find that uh, the, sort of the preferred way to proceed, uh, coming as an outsider who was not familiar with the situation in Hong Kong, it seemed to me very surprising that this was a political issue at all. Yeah. Uh, because everywhere else, you just take it for granted. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, if you find that a confrontational approach, and I'm really not familiar with Hong Kong politics, so you know, feel free to correct me, but uh, if you find that a confrontational approach is uh, causing some of the functional constituency and other uh, people who wouldn't necessarily be natural allies to become defensive, uh, something you can emphasize is this is not an angry, controversial issue. This is a very basic, good governance issue. Singapore has a, uh, a very strong archives law and a world-class archivist, uh, head of the National Archives, who travels the world lecturing. And it hasn't fallen apart yet, you know. Singapore is fine. So I think um, just to tie all of those things together, you know, there's a lot you can consider. Uh, the final point I would make about heritage is that uh, heritage and sort of building Hong Kong's brand beyond finance and malls is a big part of the Asia's world city strategy. And if you're trying to loop in people who, in the Hong Kong government, who believe in heritage, but haven't necessarily come around on the issue of archives preservation, uh, you know, recently the, the civil service is not shy about touting its accomplishments. And they even have a section on heritage preservation, which talks about buildings, but the government record service is not mentioned once. Um, so I think there's a lot of natural allies if you know where to look. Uh, but I think it's uh, important to uh, reach beyond the community of concerned people. Um, because, you know, when I call my parents at home and tell them what I'm doing here in Hong Kong, they're very confused, and I have to explain why it's important and why it matters, because we take a lot of these things for granted. Um, so I think that's most of what I would say. Yeah. Can, I, can I just defend? I do not know why one something May I just read you the wording of my motion for you to see how very, very political it is. That in order to properly manage and preserve valuable public records and provide channels for the public to access such records, this council urges the government to immediately launch public consultation on the formulation of an archives law and expeditiously proceed with its enactment. That is not a very angry kind of motion. But in Hong Kong, there, anything which tends to be critical of the government or the government sees it as being uh, critical of it, immediately is given the name of being political. And the fact that it is political is its very reason uh, not to be, uh, uh, to be avoided. Uh, that is to be avoided. And yet, until and unless something is political, the government will ignore it. So this is a very difficult kind of situation, and I think we all have to work around it. I think heritage is a good point, because there is both passion, learning, the public. It, is, it can be very soft, and it can be very hard, depending on the particular issue. So I, I really urge people to forget about the political label and just go ahead with what they consider to be right for Hong Kong. Can I just add two things? One is, on the political side, the AAG did go and <coughs> talk to all the political parties, and we got support from the KPF, we got support from the Liberal Party. But we, when we talked to the AAB, they said they did not support us. So, and, and they don't fully understand, you know, the reason for, they said, we understand, half the reason why, but we do not support you. And so, so it was political. But turning to, I think, the, the point, I think, critically made uh, by, uh, I think, all the people here, is that we, if we are going to reach out to as many groups as possible, may I just throw up one idea? We should perhaps bring children, school children, 
within our reach. It is easier to make the school children, make their parents become interested. So if we can perhaps have a program with school teachers whereby the school teachers would expose the children to records, to how, why they are, can be used, whether to do with their family or their own school and so on and so forth, maybe slowly. That is one way we can form an ally, either with school teachers or better still with school children. Who knows? Uh, even maybe either children or grandchildren of uh, Stephen Lab would say, what, what's wrong with the archives? I think one of the things that's buried in the, in the archives law is about retaining the census and statistics, census records, which have never been retained in Hong Kong. And actually, I think that's another very good story. Because if you talk to people who are interested in their family history, if they're in the UK or the US, they can go back and look at the census records 70 or 100 years ago and find out where they were living, all, all details about their household. In Hong Kong, that's never going to be possible. Nobody's ever going to be able to go back. They don't have any data at all other than the tabulation before 81. They lost the 1976 by census data because they didn't back it up properly. And they have never kept the census records, right? They have always destroyed them. So this is the sort of thing people, if you explain to them, they say, why? Why have we destroyed that part of our heritage forever when nobody else does this? Nobody else destroys it. And they're now able to go back and see their family history. I'll answer that question. Is there a lawyer in this room? Because this is supposed to be what is required by the privacy data order. They regularly tell us that according to the law, they have to destroy these things. So please, the lawyer in this room, tackle this. Margaret, I helped put that law into effect. And you know very well that they were destroying this long before there was any legislation. And as you, we all know, they used the PDPO as an excuse to justify yeah. lack That's of access. Okay. The example yeah. that Christine's got in here, Fu Kang Wang, right? They tried to argue that they couldn't give you suicide data because of PDPO. That really shows they don't understand the law. Yeah, yeah, so campaign against that ordinance. Um, could I just follow on from John? I, I think that this is a big issue uh, because we simply don't know what is, is being lost. Uh, but there is a unit within the government called the Efficiency Unit. And I know that they have huge problems making the government efficient. Uh, but I also know that they are quite tenacious and they've been in existence for a long time and they just keep chipping away and chipping away at the problem. So I, I think we need to uh, launch the Trojan Horse and uh, we need to get the efficiency unit on site because this is uh, an issue of efficiency. It's uh, storing documents that don't need to be stored for 30 years uh, and there, is, uh, there are great savings to be made. So I, if I could just suggest that this is another area that the lead group might like to look at. The only problem is that the efficiency unit reports to the chief secretary, I believe, uh -huh. which is responsible for record management. So he must be there. It's a left hand, right hand issue. Um, but I, I would like to ask the AAG a question. So have you talked to CY now? Yes. And what's his stance on that? We went to see him. He was one of the first who went to see him. And he said to us he understands the issues very clearly. In principle, he's a support. All right. And I, we, I personally, I can give you this, I personally been courting him for a long time. I asked him to come to today's meeting. He has to come. I asked him to write publicly. He has not done so. He is a very cautious man. But he is more of a political ally than Henry Ken. Because Henry Ken, with Henry Ken, there is no hope of the next administration who will have archives law. But with CY Lever, and I've said that publicly when I, I, I gave him the, the, the present to to uh, to the Apple newspaper. We possibly have a hope, especially if he wants to change and he might entertain a heritage program. Do you possibly. take any bets? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> any bets taken? I don't know, but at least at, at least on one side, it, 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 I think when we come back to this issue of building coalitions, maybe um, we should try to get um, 
Stefan that is Hong Kong is very proud of being one of the most advanced inter economies, right? So we are consistently in all these uh, uh, ratings one of the top internet economy, which means our we are advanced digital economy and our government has actually started a pilot project on opening government data. So um, I think that is maybe, a, could be a possible angle because if you have this open government data, then you will also have digital records of the past, which you can use. And then slowly, maybe from that side, you can also work on the archive law. I just think we are too narrowly focused on these archives. You need to also to link it to the future, to the digital world. And that's also completely missing. In fact, we have no piece of legislation talking about digital records. Yes, I just wondered, uh, uh, I'm you know, I'm one of the two uh, former GRS directors, you know, but uh, we have lost our job already. <laughs> uh, the archive law actually it covers I mean, not just paper record. It covers, you know, it, it covers you know, all the uh, e-record, all records in a digital form. So I mean, that the archive make it very clear. So we, yeah, I mean, so so it doesn't really matter whether the, I mean, the record creator is in electronic format or in another format. The archive law covers it all. Okay, that's that's one thing. But I want to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Vincent Wong's earlier, I mean, remarks about uh, the uh, you know playing the China China card. Because I think it's very important for us to convince legislators in Latino, uh, especially those pro Beijing, uh, especially those pro government uh, functional you know, constituents, legislators, you know, those DAB. You know, because if we can have them convinced, you know, I mean, that China is really, really uh, stressed on the importance of archive law, and China is an archive law, you know, and convince convince them. I mean, there's no harm you know, in supporting the archive law. Because, as I said, at the end of the day, they, they decided. They, they passed the resolution. Maybe if they're convinced, well, they can uh, be our very uh, effective ally. And, in fact, I actually, uh, you know, during my, uh, you know, career as an archivist, I have come to uh, know all these people in China, Beijing, you know, Director General, Deputy Director General, they all support the archive law in Hong Kong, you know. And uh, I just had a reason. I just had a reason meeting with the Deputy Director General of uh, the uh, State Archive Administration of China, and he expressed grave concern about, I mean, the absence of archive law in Hong Kong. See, because Hong Kong is part of China, you know. If Hong Kong is no archive law, no history, that means part of the part of the, the Chinese history is gone. So actually, at the end of the meeting, he came to me and wish me all the good luck, you know, in fighting for the war. We, we did tell the DAB that China also have archives law and that they are not opposed to uh, having archives law. They're in fact surprised. But, but that's not good enough because the DAB will still support the government. Yes, John. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, John, John, who has been our host and who is very generous in organizing this, uh, has uh, told us that time is up. I'd like to thank all John and all the speakers and all of you for participating in this. I hope